morning, sir. Can I help you? Hello. I'd like to test drive one of the new Vauxhalls, please. How about one of our new two-litre Cavaliers? The SRI-130. Adjustable steering, fuel injected, capable of 120 miles per hour. could try one of our new Astras, the two-litre GTE, boasting some 122 brake horsepower. <laughs> Finally, the sporting flagship of our range, the Carlton GSI 3000, car of the year, 1987, power steering, ABS, electric windows, An excellent choice, sir. Happy motoring. On TWA's ambassador business class, we have to earn our stripes every single day. You can reserve your seat before you reach the airport. You're welcomed aboard with champagne, the widest, most comfortable business seats, a menu and wines many restaurants would envy and TWA flies to nearly 100 US cities. TWA Ambassador Class, all round a better business experience. Saturday, October the 31st, and you're watching Good Morning Britain. I'm Jeff Clark. And I'm Judy Simpson. Over the next hour and a half, we'll be bringing you a whole variety of sporting guests and features. There's the latest update on the sports headlines, the weekend weather prospects from David Philpot, and David Foster will bring us the national and international news at 7 o'clock. Well, today's guests include Harry Harris, Chief Football Writer at the Daily Mirror, Chris Quentin, Brian Tilsley from Coronation Street will be with us. You might not know it, but he's a former gymnast and a big boxing fan. And with the football spotlight turning to the Merseyside Derby at Anfield tomorrow, who better to join us than David Johnson, an England international who played for both clubs. We'll be getting the latest racing news from Jim McGrath, and our features today include a look at the colossal sums of money involved in buying horses, and we'll also be taking a look at a rather unique Speedway rider. Let's hope that's whetted your appetite. And talking about getting wet, what's the weather hold in store for me today, <laughs> David? <laughs> that's, that's a smashing line, Jim. I like it. <laughs> Hi, well, most of us, I think, will get away without getting wet today, but there will be some outbreaks of rain around, and I'll tell you all about that in a minute or two. For the next few days, I think the area of uh, UK is going to be mainly dominated by high pressure. I'll show you a picture of the Atlantic chart as it looks uh, by 6 o'clock this evening. And while we've got lows to the south, lows to the left, lows to the north, and fronts all over the place, in fact, that small bit of high pressure over the North Sea, which is going to settle there over the next few days, therefore keeping it predominantly dry. Uh, and on the whole, because it's high pressure zone there, uh, fairly light in the way of winds, although it may freshen up a bit from the southeast later. And even that's a fairly warm direction. So while there may be a few night frosts, in general, it looks like fairly settled, rather cloudy perhaps, uh, light winds. Uh, and uh, not much in the way of rain. For today now, well, uh, it's a sort of a murky start for most of us and uh, a murky finish for some of us, 
Uh, and a few of us are going to have a murky middle as well, I'm afraid. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, low cloud fog and that around. And it will generally lift towards midday, but in fact, uh, one or two places may well stay a bit misty throughout the day. Now, the exception is up in the north of Scotland, where a little belt of rain is going to come through during the day, and it'll clear up a bit behind that, and the sun will come through. Also, southwest England may well see a few breaks. Otherwise, pretty cloudy for all of us. Get stuck into your computer and your old videotapes and turn up the central heating. OK, let's have a look at this morning's weather picture now. So, splitting into the three areas, a lot of fog and low cloud over, well, almost anywhere really, although Scotland and Northern Ireland are a little bit clearer than most. Outbreaks of rain occurring all over the place, but in the whole, there aren't very many of them, and on the whole, the rain is fairly light. The exception being up in the northwest there, well, there will be a bit of rain to start with. Now, by this afternoon, that'll have gone through and it'll have turned brighter in the Hebrides and northwest Scotland. There might be a few showers around. The rain itself on that little trough will actually now be into central Scotland and into Northern Ireland, but it'll be fairly weak, and though from time to time you'll find breaks in the rain, although it'll be remaining mainly cloudy. But everywhere else, south of the border, I'm afraid, cloud, muck, orid, really little bits of rain, but uh, just an unpleasant day. It won't be cold, though. And by this evening, clearing in the northwest, fog returning to the south. I did mention there would be a few breaks in the southwest, didn't I? And in fact, some of those breaks by evening may be into South Wales and central England, too. Nevertheless, fog might form in the cold air as well. So a fairly uncertain night, but light winds. Temperatures then today. Well, that's uh, really a little bit warm for the time of year, maybe a degree or two up above average. Light winds, except for up in the north there, well, they'll be around a stern of that bit of rain coming through. Somewhere today's weather, then. Dum -dum -dum -dum, three films, as described before. Have you read that? <laughs> OK, tomorrow. Well, most of the dry weather that's coming into the northwest will have got down into Ireland and Scotland overnight, so frosty there. And apart from a little bit of rain perhaps coming into the northwest later, we're not a bad day tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, thank you. <laughs> Murky Philpot, he will be back with another look at the weather at 6.30 and just before 7, you've been warned. Time now, though, to catch up with the latest overnight sports headlines from Judy. And the big overnight news is that the race for the Formula One Drivers' Championship is over. Nigel Mansell is out of tomorrow's Japanese Grand Prix, and that means his Williams Honda teammate, Nelson Piquet, is this year's World Drivers' Champion. Mansell was declared unfit to take part in the race in the early hours of this morning, following a 90 miles an hour crash during practice yesterday. Mansell's car flipped into the air off a crash barrier, and although he broke no bones, the British driver was badly bruised and clearly in pain. Mansell has been kept in hospital overnight, and his withdrawal from the race hands Nelson Piquet a record equaling third Formula One World Championship. Tennis, and not surprisingly, the United States have retained the Whiteman Cup. Joe Droy was beaten by Pam Shriver, and Sarah Gomez and Claire Wood lost their doubles match to give the United States a 4-0 lead in the best of seven series. Meanwhile, John McEnroe has been knocked out of the European Community Open in Antwerp. McEnroe lost to Czechoslovakian Miloslav Mershish, who now meets Mats Vilander in the semi-finals. In the other semi-final, Ivan Lendl meets Pat Cash, a repeat of this year's Wimbledon final. On to the rugby, and two big matches this weekend. Bradford Northern replay their Yorkshire Cup final against Castleford at Ellen Road this afternoon. And world record signing Gary Schofield makes his debut for Leeds in tomorrow's league match against champions Wigan at Headingley. Football, and Spurs Argentine international Ozzy Ardiles is about to open a new chapter in his career. Ardiles has been appointed Tottenham's acting player coach in a backroom shake-up instigated by new manager Terry Venables. Doug Livermore takes charge of team affairs until Venable starts work on December the 1st, while Trevor Hartley, acting manager after David Pleat resigned last Friday, has been sacked. In the Barclays League Division 3 last night, Southend held second place Warsaw 1 all, while in the 4th Division, Colchester beat Darlington 2-1, and Cambridge won at Tranmere 1-0. Finally, squash, and today's ICI Perspex World Team Final at the Royal Albert Hall pairs New Zealand and Pakistan. In the semi-finals, New Zealand beat England 2-1, while Pakistan won by the same margin against Australia. Back to you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, let me uh, tell you the time. Seven minutes past six o'clock. Good morning to you. 
Well, our first guest this morning is the leading football writer from the Daily Mirror, Harry Harris. Now, Harry began his journalistic career 17 years ago, deciding, almost from day one, that there could be no better occupation than being paid to watch the game he loves. Well, today that fascination remains, and during the current football season, he scooped many an exclusive story, including the announcement of the Football League sponsorship deal with Barclays, the one and a half million pounds transfer of Richard Goff from Spurs to Rangers, and only last Saturday he told the world, or at least the mirror readers in it, that Terry Venables would be the next Spurs manager. You don't mince your words, Harry. Good morning. Good morning, Jeff. <coughs> yeah. Tremendous build-up. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 All right, the first question is, why do you seem to get more scoops than anybody else? Yes, the easy question's first, yeah. Yes. Um, <coughs> Well, I'd like to say it's charm and personality, Jeff, but I'd be lying. Um, <laughs> I think it's uh, all down to uh, hard work. I think the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. Do you work on your own? Are, are you the, the one who does all the phone calling, the knocking on the door? Are you one of a team of millions? Uh, um, I think um, it's all a question of uh, starting early and finishing late. Um, more hours, the, the more stories, I think. Talking of finishing late, there's a lovely story going around about how you uh, actually got to work for Mr. Maxwell at the Mirror. You were still in the office at 10 o'clock or something? Yes, I was working for the uh, Daily Mail at the time, Jeff, and um, I uh, received a, a PA flash that was passed to me by the desk uh, announcing that uh, Robert Maxwell had taken over as uh, Oxford United chairman. Uh, obviously a very intriguing story, and uh, I made uh, it my business to try and contact Mr. Maxwell and uh, about half past ten, quarter to eleven at night, I finally got through to him and he was most amazed by this, uh, that anyone in fact had taken the trouble to contact him that late at night. So impressed in fact that he, so he offered me a job on the spot. He said, uh, I'd like you to uh, work for me, you're the type of person that uh, I'd like in my employee. And I said, well, I'd love to. And he said, well, I'd, I'd uh, treble your salary, anything you'd like. <laughs> well, that impressed me, I must admit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was, yes. I was, I was suitably impressed. Yes. Well, I, I explained to him you know, that uh, uh, my uh, one and only uh, love in life was uh, working uh, as a football journalist, and um, he really didn't have an opening that would suit me. And he said, uh, and this impressed me again, yeah. he said, uh, when I uh, buy the Daily Mirror, you can come and work for me. Well, nice. So that's why I bought the mirror, just to give just you a job. job. Yes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> delighted by that. Yeah. Oh well, so it pays to work late at the office. Uh, everyone can well, be warned about yeah. that one. With the reputation you've got of getting so many exclusives and getting right into the real story, are people like managers and players a, a touch wary of talking to you? Uh, well, I'd hope not. No. Um, the the, uh, the key word I would use is trust. Um, I've uh, based that on my uh, career all the way through. And uh, no doubt there's people that don't trust me and there's people that do trust me. But uh, anyone that um, uh, gives me any information which is off the record is strictly off the record. And that's just a way to build up the reputation, presumably? Well, yes. Um, uh, trust is very important. Uh, and uh, I would hope that uh, uh, when, when I'm looking back on my career that people will say that they could trust me. In fact, uh, the, the journalist I looked up to most of all in my career was uh, Victor Alton on the old evening news. He was a great personal friend of mine. And uh, uh, his key word was trust. Everyone could trust him. All right. In the, the build-up we gave you of the exclusives, um, which one out of all of the scoops you've had has given you most satisfaction, both personally and professionally? Well, I think um, this season's one about uh, the Barclays League. It was a very uh, positive uh, story about football. I mean, football's taken an awful lot of knocks since high school. And I think in the last 18 months, football has in fact recovered very significantly. And with any luck, we should be back in Europe next season. And I think uh, for a major sponsor like Barclays, to sponsor the Football League was a significant story. And to be able to break that story when it was actually announced, on the day it was announced, gave me a great deal of satisfaction. The other side of that coin is that the occasional one goes wrong. Now, we, we did warn you <laughs> this. We're not, we're not throwing you totally in, in the deep end. Um, the Elton John one, selling Watford. I thought you were a friend of mine, Jeff. I was. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened with that one? Well, whenever I put my name to a story, I would hope it would be an accurate story. And uh, at that particular time, I was convinced that Elton John was in the process of selling Watford. Uh, nothing has occurred since that convinces me otherwise that at that time he was thinking about selling Watford. 
and I'm sticking to that. You're st <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the next exclusive then in the pipeline? In fact, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, come the day that he decides to do that uh, even now. All right. Come on, your next one. What are you working on now? Um, I can't tell you, Jeff. Give the game away. My rivals may be watching. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. English teams back into Europe. That on, the, on, the, uh, on the agenda, do you think? Oh, almost certainly, yes. Uh, I think uh, there's been a, a significant upswing in, in football in this country. Uh, uh, hooliganism is, is certainly under control. And uh, I would think that there's an extremely good chance that we'll be back in Europe next season. Fingers crossed. Oh, let's hope so. Harry Harris, uh, yes, English teams back into Europe. Yes. We always have to say, of course, the Scots are already there. Um, St Mirren, here we come next week. <coughs> Harry Harris for the moment, thank you very much indeed. We're now on to racing with the time 13 and a bit past six. Four meetings today. They're on the flat at Newmarket and over the jumps at Weatherby, Worcester and Sandown. Now, TVAM's racing expert Jim McGrath here once again to drop a huge hint or two about possible winners. Let's begin as usual though, Jim, with all the important up to the minute going news. Morning. Good morning. I notice you never actually say find a winner, just yes. drop a hint about a winner. Well, I'm saving your reputation, old son. Well, the going news is fairly straightforward this morning, the overnight news anyway. At Weatherby, it's good. And at the other three tracks, Worcester, Newmarket and Sandown, it's good to soft. But we will, of course, be ringing the courses during the next hour and updating you at 20 past seven. All right. Up at Weatherby, Federation, Clubs, Racing Day, what's all that about? Federation, Clubs, um, throughout the country there are, are, are racing clubs. Scotland, West, North West Racing Club, uh, East Midlands, West Midlands, can't remember them all. Um, <laughs> West Berkshire, umpteen of them to encourage the, the, the people in the street, the ordinary people, to go racing whenever they can. And today they've organised a day at Weatherby, uh, whereby they have got concession to get in at a cheaper price. Um, they are going to have a, a dinner in Leeds this evening, hundreds of them. There's a racing mastermind competition, a national oh. racing mastermind you this that? evening. Oh, no, are you not nearly <laughs> good enough, Jeffrey. <laughs> Too afraid as well. Yes. And then tomorrow, <laughs> most importantly, they've got an open day from 10 to 1 at uh, five of um, Moulton's top racing yards, Bill Elsie, Jimmy Fitzgerald, Malcolm Jefferson, Colin Tinkler, Nigel Tinkler, uh, all to raise money for the Stable Lads Welfare Trust. All right, sounds like a good Anybody can go to that. All right, wonderful. Sounds a good weekend at Weatherby, but there's some trouble with uh, safety and fences uh, yesterday. Yes, uh, th there was a, a lot of complaints after the meeting at Weatherby yesterday. There were 16 casualties in three steeplechases, which is quite a lot. Um, and the main complaint was that a new fence, the last fence, Jeff, in the straight, which has been redesigned, uh, hadn't been sighted properly. It's all right having a fence of a certain size and a certain width, but there must be um, a takeoff ground for the horses to judge properly. It must be sloped correctly. And that was the main complaint. And it wasn't just from one trainer or one jockey. It was a unanimous decision, and they're going to look at that this morning. Uh, hopefully it doesn't mean that we'll get mass withdrawals from Weatherby today because uh, there's a fine card in prospect there. How easy or difficult is it to move the fence? I mean, is that a possibility or do they have to make the ground safer at the takeoff? Point? No, they'll have to alter the fence. Uh -huh. uh, hopefully that can be done, if not today, then uh, in, in the near future, certainly for the next meeting. And then the fences have to be inspected by the inspector of courses, mm -hmm. which of course this one had been done before. And hopefully less injuries today. Well, uh, touch wood, there were no serious injuries yesterday. There were just a lot of casualties. Okay. Um, so, hope, yeah, I don't right, want any more injuries. Right. Look forward to a good day up there. The uh, biggest prize today on the flats up at Newmarket? Yeah, the biggest prize on the flat at Newmarket is the Mail on Sunday Handicap Final. There have been a series of these races throughout the season. And it looks like Her Majesty the Queen could have a winner uh, with Versatile, who won a qualifier of this at York last time out. And we can take a look at that. Uh, he won by four lengths three weeks ago. And the significant point about the performance, Jeff, was in soft ground. He came from a long way off the place. He's a horse with a noseband, just threading his way through the field. But he'd been at the back. And to me, that smacks not just only that he's well suited by some given the ground, which he's got at Newmarket today, but that he's a horse with a fair bit more ability than his handicap mark uh, might suggest. He finished very strongly, one going right away. Several of these horses uh, in this race at York are in the field this afternoon and on the form book have no chance of beating him. He's got to run below form uh, for them to beat him this afternoon. He won that very easily. All right, is that, uh, that going to be your tip for today? Afraid so. Yeah, I've remembered to mention it Big this week. Nice of you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having ignored him twice last week, you then tipped a good winner, didn't you? Yeah, the, 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 but the, it's the surprise of the voice on a Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let's do it officially. Your tip for today, then, your, your big race big tip Big race for tip today. for today is Versatile and the 2.15 at Newmarket. And 
the Saturday long shot. This is the one I like. Especially for David Philpot, this, after the gloom. <laughs> Let's hope it comes out of the gloom. 3.50 Newmarket. All right, just very briefly, Cawthon Edery, seven and a bit days to go, finishes next Saturday. Steve Cawthon further ahead now? Four ahead, 191 to 187, and in my view has a good chance of going five ahead this afternoon. Pat, in my opinion, now no chance. Ooh, you heard it here first. <laughs> Steve, uh, Steve Cawthon has a uh, couple more rides today than, than Pat does. No, in fact, uh, Pat has more rides than Steve. I knew it was one way around. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, s neither of them have a particularly good book. I think Steve has one ride, Galitzin, with a, with a decent chance, but uh, the, the rest of the rides between them, I, I don't think will be troubling the judge first. All right, Jim McGrath, thank you very much indeed. Uh, there we are, big hints about where to put your money on the horses there. As for the Greyhounds, well, Mike Palmer from the Racing Post is going for Lone Wolf in the 920 at Wimbledon. That's Lone Wolf, Trap 6 in the 920 at Wimbledon. And I can tell you that uh, James Baker from the Wider Weight Club office went to the dogs last night, so to speak, and he saw Mike Palmer's tip yesterday romping home. So Mr Palmer in good form. Certainly is getting it right. So as we've heard, some top horses in action in today's racing. The search for a champion of course never stops, nor is it cheap, and it's certainly not for the faint-hearted as Jerry Foley now reports. It was, it has to be said, a very clever marketing ploy. Take a well-established bloodstock sales agency like Goffs, add in the prestige of a name like Cartier, introduce a new million pound race open only to yearlings bought at these sales, and it all adds up to one of the most profitable October sales ever held. Buying was brisk, with average prices up by over 40% on previous years. The big names came with their big money, and never had the stakes been so high. Everyone was on the lookout for that magical yearling, which in just 12 months' time would be capable of beating all comers to take a record first prize of half a million pounds in the world's richest ever two-year-old race. The prize, the million pounds, it's such an attractive sound, the Cartier million. It speaks of everything, you know, snow princesses and the lot. And I just think that the, uh, the feeling all next year, the on the day, I'd go to a motor race for a million pounds because of the million pound aspect. I expect the race course to be packed out. I expect the cameras and the newspapers of the world to be looking towards the Irish racing industry next year because of this enormous promotion. Behind the promotion lies a genuine desire to attract a broader cross-section of people into racehorse ownership. Small-time syndicates were encouraged for these sales and the organisers are convinced that new blood has been attracted into the industry. I think the promotion of the million pound sale is very, very good. Uh, I, I think it's good for the industry that we're trying to attract new people into it and, and, and we've managed to do that. One such example is Pierre Doyle, a somewhat flamboyant character well known in Dublin as a nightclub host and a powered radio station owner, but up until now less well known as a racehorse owner. His syndicate is motivated by very basic, if understandable, emotions. I think essentially we're fun people and we want to buy some horses and we want to see this million. I want to see this million stashed up on a table, I want to look at it. We're fun people, we're in this to buy a horse or horses to win this specific race, not any other race, and that is the criteria we have set. Other, more established buyers took a slightly more cautious view of their chances of winning the really big money. Well, if you buy the right type of horse, I mean, it's up to the horse, really, then, isn't it? You just need the best of luck in it, training it, and just hope that it stays sound and it, it, it qualifies to run. Are you, good, are you good at picking the right type of horse? No, yeah, not bad. <laughs> the owners and trainers of the 248 yearlings bought at these unique October sales are already working hard to get their horses ready for next October's big race. And with a million pounds in prize money at stake, it promises to be one of the most fascinating races of 1988. Jerry Foley, TVAM, Ireland. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, lots and lots of money involved in horse racing, of course. Well, one of the ways that we try and convince our early guests to come onto the program is to give them the chance to talk about a particular hobby horse or an issue which concerns them personally. Well, Harry Harris, a football writer from the Daily Mirror, is a man who spends much of his time knocking on the doors of football clubs, and he's well aware that many of them are highly suspicious of the media in general. He believes the fans would benefit if the football clubs were a little more forthcoming. Harry, good morning again. You were yes. talking earlier that a lot of your reputation is, is based on trust. Um, there are some other, perhaps more scurrilous people who their reputation is not as good as yours. I mean, does that have a knock-on effect of you? Is it harder to build trust these days? Well, yes, Jeff, it is, unfortunately. Um, I would like to see the uh, barriers broken down between uh, football 
and the media. I think that would have a beneficial, beneficial effect. I would like to see the, um, uh, the uh, hypocrisy gone from the game, where you have uh, a diet of misinformation and no information, which is a breeding ground for speculation and inaccurate reporting. And on the other hand, uh, football clubs are only too eager to welcome you in, five course meal, champagne, as long as you mention the sponsor. Now I think this is uh, totally, totally wrong. And I think uh, it's something that should be looked at by my own association, the Football Writers Association, and the Football League and the Football Association. I think um, the, the speculation, uh, the misinformation, I, I would think is more the responsibility of the football clubs. They should be keen to inform their own supporters through the media about what's happening at their football clubs. Now obviously, on the, on the other side, I understand that, that suspicion does exist. And in a lot of cases, quite rightly. Uh, there is mistrust of uh, journalists. Uh, there are some scurrilous reporting and reporters. Uh, but it's up to the football clubs to s sort out uh, the good from the bad. But um, their main responsibility is to inform their, their football fans. Some people may uh, well say, though, that if the clubs make it that much easier, it makes your job easier. I mean, are you after an easier life for the likes of Harry Harris? Certainly, Jeffrey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am indeed. The, the truth, the truth <laughs> from a journalist. <laughs> All right. We'll leave it there for the moment. Harry, thanks for that. Uh, but with the time, 6.23, uh, we've got to move on. More from Harry Harris in a couple of moments' time as we delve into our sports bag. For the moment, though, we take a quick break. Don't go away. <laughs> Listen, I can't keep it to myself any longer. Simply had to tell you about our new Coleman's Homestyle Cooking Sauces. Well, we have put the very best ingredients in a special pack that seals in the freshness and flavour. So there's no need for any added artificial colours or preservatives. They're just like you'd make yourself. If only you had the time. You'll find Coleman's Homestyle Cooking Sauces make an everyday meal Simply delicious. Coleman's. Always make the best a touch better. Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of York. In the first television interview since her marriage, she talks exclusively to David Frost on TVAM about her life, public and private. On the day we get our first glimpse of her latest literary project, a book on the Palace of Westminster, she gives a behind-the-scenes insight to her working life when not on duties of state. That's the Duchess of York, exclusively on TVAM, this coming Monday morning at 8.10. Warm welcome back to Saturday Sport. Once again, let me take this opportunity of thanking you all very much indeed for your letters and your telephone calls. I promise you they're always welcome. Keep them coming. Now, many of you believe that Joe Bugner got his just desserts against Frank Bruno last Saturday night, but Mr. MJ Anderson from Manchester is still concerned that Bruno is being pushed too quickly. He says it was a good performance by our Frank, but it was no ticket to meet a boxer like Mike Tyson. Well, I was lucky enough to be at that fight. Uh, Bruno did everything that was asked of him, dispatching an aging boxer in Joe Bugner, let's be honest about it. I'm not convinced that he'll win against Tyson. If I had to be totally honest, I'd, I wouldn't want him to fight him. Harry Harris is with me. You were there at the fight. Any views on this? Bruno going in against Mike Tyson? Yes, I was there. Uh, tremendous event, I must say. It was uh, staged uh, with a great deal of style. Um, I'd like to see that uh, happen again at football grounds. I'd like to see stadiums used like that. When Frank said, uh, where are you, Harry? I thought he meant me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a number one contender, and I'd like to see him uh, have a go and uh, knock out Tyson. Dangerous, though. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in with him. Mind you, I suppose all boxing is dangerous, isn't it? It is. <laughs> right. Well, many of you are also taking the opportunity to push for more media coverage of what is generally and dangerously, perhaps, called minority sports. Well, this time, Ronald Nickel from Ayrshire is pleading how about a feature on ice hockey for the thousands of devoted fans in this country? 
Mr. Nickel goes on, I defy anyone not to become hooked on the world's fastest team sport. Well, I'm not just saying this, but I can genuinely tell you that uh, the sports editor and I were talking to somebody yesterday about doing just such a feature on ice hockey. Tremendous sport, very fast indeed. I don't know why we call it minority sport. It has a big following up and down, Harry. Well, I love it. I, I think it's very exciting. I think it will catch on. Um, it's easy to understand, easy to follow, and um, I think it will catch on indeed, yes. And Tottenham Hotspur, should they have a, an ice hockey team? Um, I'd settle for a team. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a brave man. <laughs> Sorry about <Well>, yeah. that. <laughs> Finally, a letter that was addressed to the chief person at TVAM, no less, and even marked very urgent. It's from Peter Phillips, who at the tender age of 22 tells us he's become the youngest ever prospective billiards and snooker foundation national coach. Peter proudly adds, as I'm also from North Wales, this is an absolutely unbelievable achievement which had almost impossible odds of succeeding. As you can tell, Mr. Williams is a modest, shy, introverted young man. He continues, I am therefore writing to ask you if you would be kind enough to let me appear on your morning television program. Don't hide your light under a what's-it. I'm sorry though, Peter, it's not quite as easy as all that. As you can see, we have to meet some very stringent standards before inviting people to appear on Saturday Sport. So we'll be looking forward to hearing from you when you're coach to the world champion. Having said all that, it's no bad thing, is it, to push yourself? Not at all, no. no. It's, uh, it's a way to get on in life. Um, when you spoke earlier about how do you get all your scoops, I mean, you, you, you've got to be a bit pushy, I suppose. Um, You've got to keep on, but um, at the end of the day, you've got, you've got to uh, have faith and rely on your contacts. You can push to a degree, but um, only to a degree. All right, there we are then, Peter. Keep up the good work, keep pushing. Just a very brief word, Harry, from you about football. The main one uh, is certainly in England tomorrow, Anfield, Liverpool, Everton. How are we going to go on that? Quick prediction. Well, I've seen Liverpool play a, a few times this season, and I thought they were totally unbeatable, I've got to say. I thought they would walk away with the, the championship. Most surprised that they lost in midweek in the Cup. Uh, I think they will get their revenge tomorrow. All right, lovely. Uh, don't forget, we've got David Johnson, former Everton and Liverpool striker, former international, of course, coming in uh, just after the news at seven. Back to the letters briefly, if you've got anything that you feel a need to tell the nation about, please drop us a line. The address to write to, quite simply, is this one. Sports Bag, TVAM, Camden Lock, London, NW18TQ. One more time, Sports Bag, TVAM, Camden Lock, London, NW18TQ. We look forward to hearing from you. Judy. Yes, we really enjoy reading those letters, so keep them coming in. And uh, we'll have more viewer opinions from Sports Bag next Saturday. Now, Sports Quiz is another of our regular features, and this morning we're launching a new competition with a great prize in store for tennis fans. We're offering a family box for four people of the Nabisco Masters Doubles at the Royal Albert Hall on Saturday, December the 12th. And there will also be a fabulous champagne lunch with transport to and from the tennis. It's an outstanding tournament featuring the best doubles players in the world, and all you have to do to win is answer these three questions. Question one. This pair in white won last year's Nabisco Masters title and have also captured two Grand Slam titles this year. We want to know who they are. <laughs> Question two. The 1987 Wimbledon doubles champions will also be taking part. What are their names? And question three, back in July, this couple provided Britain with a rare Wimbledon triumph. Can you name them? Answers on a postcard, please. The